All right. Uh, in that case, let's uh, get started. First of all, hello, friends. What's popping? <laughs> all right. Well, uh, let's uh, start talking about electric currents and magnetism. We talked about this last week where Hans Ersted discovered completely by accident that running an electrical current through a wire causes it to begin behaving like a magnet, attracting the needle of a compass. No, they don't. Oh, you're not a needle? No. Uh, and since then, of course, we, we probed further and have discovered quite a bit more about it. But the core relationship that is the uh, subject of this week's lesson is that between electric currents and magnetic fields. Typically, an electric current moves through a wire and your electric current through wire is gonna happen in one of two kinds of wires. Either the wire will be straight, that is stretched taut from end to end, or your wire may be looped. Of course, if you only have a short segment of it being straight, uh, for example, here. From here to here, this is a straight wire. But if you could also make the argument that it's straight from here to here, well, that's no good. You've got to have the whole thing be straight, which is why those questions often have, um, have the qualifier a long straight wire to indicate that the whole thing is uh, straight over a distance. But for a straight wire, if you're trying to find the magnetic field around the wire, easiest way to do that is with the right hand rule. Remember that a current conventionally moves through a wire. Now conventionally just means that like, we accept that this is the direction from positive to negative terminal on the battery. So a current moving that way through the wire would be called a positive current. So we've got a positive current moving up the wire. Well, then the magnetic field around the wire would be circular in shape at any point, let's say right around here. So it's circling around the wire. As you get farther out from the wire, it gets weaker and weaker. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And it would swirl around the wire specifically in this direction. So if it's going from north to south, then your north might be over here and your south might be over here and it's swirling that way. If you are ever stuck trying to figure one of these out, all you have to do is remember your right hand rule. You point your thumb in the direction of the current in the wire and your fingers of your right hand will curl in the direction of the magnetic field lines which is why I was able to be very certain that this would be the direction for the magnetic field. If we had another wire nearby, where we had the positive terminal connected here and the negative terminal connected here, then our magnetic field would end up being reversed because the direction of the current would be reversed. So your magnetic field would loop around in this direction. And you can do that with the right hand rule as well. You put your thumb down and you see your fingers curling in this way. If you have a negative current, all you have to do is use your left hand. 
But for the most part, we're going to be dealing with positive currents because that's the convention. And therefore, your right hand will be nice and useful. For anyone who was having trouble following that, here's the right hand rule illustrated. Your thumb represents a positive current and your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. Magnetic field usually given the symbol capital B. Why is it B for magnetic field? I don't know, uh, but it is. The more current you have, the more magnetic field strength you will have. And we can find that relationship with an equation. Magnetic field strength is equal to current through the wire I times the permeability of free space. You would read this as mu naught, or the initial conditions for magnetism. Permeability of free space is a constant that measures how well magnetic fields move through empty space. So because all of our magnets exist in our universe, and by space, I don't mean like outer space. I mean like distance between you and me. You and I exist in the same universe right now. There may be 15, 20 miles between us because I live in Temple Terrace and you guys are, uh, for the most part, in like Valrico or whatever. But that space is in this universe. And if I had a powerful enough magnet, maybe I could pull you over here. Uh, but I would be limited by how well magnetism travels through the space in our universe. We acknowledge that with this constant mu naught, the permeability of space letting magnetism through it. And I said earlier that the farther you are from the wire, the weaker it gets. That is inverse proportion, so it needs to be on the bottom of this side. And since this expands out in a circle, it goes out by two pi r. So this is the magnetic field around a long straight wire. Depends on two factors, the current through the wire and how far you are from it. For a looped wire, if you have one loop, then the most important thing for you to know about that situation is the shape of the magnetic field. For one loop, you can just trace it around at every point in the loop using the right hand rule. Positive to negative, so our current's going up through this kind of base part of it. So our fingers curl around in this direction. So it's looping around this way. Then at this point, it's going around that way as well. The current has to turn here. So the current is going this way. Thumb going this way. Now the magnet, magnetic field is curling over the wire. Here, it's going down. So it's curling here. If you trace that all the way around, it basically ends up kind of looking like a bar magnet's magnetic field. And turn it sideways and it becomes more obvious. A bar magnet would have a loop, and remember we're turning this sideways, like here. Well, so with this, from the top of the loop. On the sides, it would be going like this. Oh, well, that'd be true here too. On the other side, it'd loop around the other direction. Oh, there you go. So if you have a single loop, the general shape of a single loop carrying a current, otherwise it would have no magnetic field, resembles that of a bar magnet. If you have many loops, 
then just like having a whole bunch of atoms in a magnetic domain or sticking a whole bunch of bar magnets next to each other, then what's going to happen is you will get reinforcement. They add up. Each loop works with the next one. Assuming that they're lined up in a way where they can reinforce, if you line them up oppositely, like if you had your loops crisscross making X's as opposed to coiling outward nicely, if they crisscross, they're gonna cancel. But if you line them up nicely, they reinforce. So it can be much, much stronger than the straight wire. You just need to take your wire and wind it. When you have a wire that has been wound into a coil of many loops, that is called a solenoid. You put the current in here, it comes back out here. And in the middle, you will get magnetic field lines from every single coil adding up and adding up and adding up and you get this really fantastic magnetic field strength in the middle of your solenoid. This is the key to so many different technologies that turn electricity into work. Uh, for example, an electric fan spins because this magnetic field pushes on a magnet that sits inside of the solenoid. You can, um, you can find the strength of the magnetic field in a solenoid pretty easily. I would argue that it's actually an easier formula than the uh, single wire. It's just your magnetic field will be dependent still on the current, more current through the wire, you're always gonna get more magnetic strength. But the more loops you have, the stronger it's gonna be. But instead of being farther from the wire, because we're just talking about the inside of the loop, what would matter is how far apart your loops are, how, how many loops do you get per amount of space? Because if you have like, a thousand loops, but they're all a meter apart. Uh, that's pathetic. So the length of the coil uh, or how far apart the loops are, however you want to look at that, is going to be important. And lastly, because the space inside of the coil is the space in the universe, we will need to do mu naught as our constant. All right, that is the briefest recap of this week's lesson I think I could possibly give. Are you guys ready to start going over some of the check questions? Sure. All right. Yes. Uh, if so, uh, remember that we can do the, um, we can do uh, those little reaction things if you're shy about uh throwing out answers uh, so you can just do like a thumbs up or whatever but the lesson check was everyone able to open that picture on Edsby I did have a couple of students who uh, said that they had trouble opening the image was anyone not able to open that image because if so I can put the book on the projector right now you already showed me the photo, so I'm good. Okay. All right. Well, Blake just asked to see it again just so that he could get a clearer picture of it. Here you go. You can screenshot that now. I'll hit focus to make sure that it is absolutely visible to everybody. And we don't Blake, have to write the questions, do we? Do what? We don't have to write the questions, do we? No, you don't need to write the questions, no. Uh, the important thing to me is that you give me answers and that I know what the answers are to. <laughs> so just giving me nice, clear answers uh, and either numbering them or making it clear uh, what they're supposed to be to, that'll be fine. All right, uh, hopefully everyone who's got this, uh, who, who needs this has got this now. So let's look. Number 14. How can the thumb and fingers of your right hand be used to identify the direction of a magnetic field? 
Well, we just went over that by the right hand rule. So you could either give me a, that diagram that I doodled, uh, you could give me that again, or you could put it into words. Since I already doodled the diagram once, let's write it out in words this time. You point the thumb of your right hand. Ah, my handwriting is falling apart, speaking of my right hand. Uh, in the direction of the current. And your fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic field. Nice and easy. Nothing wrong with that one. Number 15. What happens to the magnetic field from a current carrying wire if you double the current? So for 15A and for 15B, it's about a long straight current carrying wire. So let's look back at that formula. The magnetic field in a long straight current carrying wire is the current being carried times the permeability of free space divided by two pi radial distance from the wire. Fifteen A says if you double the current what happens to the magnetic field? Well let's assume that nothing else changes. If nothing else changes then we would just have B and the only other change would be current. So these two things are proportional. What kind of proportion do we have if they're both on the tops of their respective sides of the equation? What kind of proportion is this? Inverse? Inverse would uh, be if one was on the top and the other was on the bottom. If these are both on the top of their separate sides, then if I multiply this one by two, I have to multiply this one by two. Okay, so they're parallel? Oh no, they're not called like that there. Starts with a D. Damn, English is hard. Hold on. <laughs> Dependent? Close. Oh, direct. Direct proportion. I was trying. It's, I appreciate it. Like you said, English is hard. A uh, direct proportion. So a direct proportion is where they scale up together. So if one of them doubles, that affects the other directly. This one doubles, that one doubles. So if I double the current, I should get double the magnetic field strength. Makes sense. Notice that there's no squares or anything. So there's no like inverse square, or if I double this, I quadruple that, or if I cut this in mm -hmm. half, this is four times stronger. This is just nice, simple. One is direct, one is inverse. So doubling the current will cause the magnetic field to double as well. So it'll be twice as strong. For the other relationship, if we assume that nothing else was changing, then it would just be a matter of B and the radial distance from the wire. 15B asks, if you double the distance from the wire, what happens to the magnetic field? Well, B is inversely proportional to that radial distance. In an inverse proportion, if you divide by, because this is your result, which is dependent on dividing by this. 
If you divide by a larger number, what happens to your result? Um, can you divide a second time? Well, you'd be dividing by a bigger number, so you should get a smaller result. For example, one half of a pizza is a lot bigger than one fourth of a pizza. So when you change that number that is like being divided by to a bigger number, you get a smaller answer. So if we were four times the distance, this would get cut down to a fourth. If we were 100 times farther, this gets cut down to one hundredth. But we're not doing that. We're just doubling the distance. So doubling the distance from the wire would have the magnetic field for both of these you just make the same change you do to the other side so if we double this we double that we put a two on the bottom of this side we put a two on the bottom of the other side just simple proportion. Number 16 is worded in a really weird way. Uh, if there was any of these questions where I was like most skeptical of, it was definitely number 17, uh, or excuse me, number 16, just because it was kind of hard to understand the way it was written. So I'll do my best to help you out. Pair up the following phrases so that they correctly relate the type of magnetic force to the type of current. Attractive force, repulsive force, same direction current, opposite direction currents. All right, so this one is goofy, but I'll translate it for you. The part about same and opposite direction currents is talking about having two wires next to each other. We'll start with the same direction currents. So if we have this one going up the wire, then we must also have this one going up the wire. And our directions of the currents are the same. Then we have to pair that with either attractive force or repulsive force, whichever one describes the situations. All right, well, the magnetic field around this one would go out in a circle and the direction of the circle would curl this way. We can use the right hand rule to prove that. So there's our magnetic field B for this one. We do the same thing again here for this one. North to south, north to south. Remember, these are curling north to south. So if we've got a north here, a south here, a north here, a south here, because they curl in the same direction. Now look at those two poles right here. What kind of poles are those? Similar or opposite? Come on guys, help me out. Similar. Similar would mean that if one is uh, south, the other one is the south. Here we have a south and a north. But isn't it where like, since it's south and north, then they're both magnetic to each other? But do you mean that they both have to be like north and north or south and south? That's what like I meant by similar. Similar would imply that, yeah, they're like the same kind of pole. Okay. Uh, but these are opposite poles. And what happens when you put two opposite magnetic poles near each other? They attract? They attract. So the force here should be attractive. So if you have two same direction currents next to each other, 
the wires would experience an attraction toward each other. And here's the interesting part. If you had these two wires here and they were floppy and kind of bendable, so that not like stiff, hard wires that, that couldn't really do much, but if you have long floppy wires hanging like this next to each other, then when you turn them on, they would actually bow toward each other, which is kind of neat. And you, this would be something that you could physically like see. So the wires would bow toward each other. The other situation would be if I had a wire going this way and a wire going this way, and we had opposite direction currents. That would be having this one going up the wire, this one going down the wire. Our magnetic field around the one on the left, right hand rule, it would curl this way. Remember it's going north to south. So this one would curl around the other direction like this going north to south. So label that. North to south is the direction this one is pointing. North to south is the direction this one is pointing. And look at those two poles in the middle. This time, everyone can tell we have got similar poles. Similar magnetic poles will exert what kind of force? They will repel each other. They will be repulsive. So we would have a repulsive force. What would that look like? You would see the two wires push away from each other. So they would bow outward. I'm realizing now that there was something that I meant to go over at the very beginning that I did not yet go over. And that was a bit of notation that makes dealing with like the 3D aspect of this a little bit easier. For those of you who watched the video, what does this symbol mean? Out of the page. Out of the page is completely correct. Out of the page. And this symbol would mean into the page. Easier to remember if you've got a mental image of an arrow. Those feathers at the end of an arrow that provide flight stability, kind of like the fins of your rockets from our lab first semester, these feathers are called the fletching. If you look at an arrow shooting down into the page from above it, you would see those fletching arrows sticking out, and that's what this is supposed to be. If an arrow was coming up to hit you in the eye, then you would see the tip of the point, which is what that's supposed to be. So if we had a current in a wire coming out of the page, our magnetic field would curl like this. So it would go around like this. It would be going counterclockwise. If we had the current going into the page, then our magnetic field would go around clockwise. This notation can also be used for the magnetic fields themselves. Like if we had a wire running along like this with the current going toward the right, stick your thumb toward the right above the wire, your fingers are curling up toward you, which means they'd be coming out of the page. And below, they curl back under, so they'd be going into the page. This will come in handy in just a second. See, that was a joke, right hand rule come in handy. Yeah, I'm funny. Number 17, if you have the number of loops 
in a solenoid while doubling its length, does the magnetic field increase, decrease, or stay the same? So number 17, we've got like this solenoid. Let's say that it's 20 loops in 10 centimeters. And then we cut the number of loops in half while doubling the length of the thing. So we would have fewer loops and they'd be farther apart. Which one of these is going to be stronger? No one's got a guess? 20 loops, because it's closer together. Yeah, you've got more loops, so that actually makes it stronger right there. If you didn't change the length and just add in more loops, that would make it stronger. But then also making them closer together, so you've got more to work together, and they're closer so they can work together more easily. Both of those changes going from here to here would make it stronger. So if we go from here to here, there's fewer loops to work together and they're having a harder time because they're farther apart. So that would make the field strength decrease. And in fact, we can figure out pretty precisely how much weaker it would be. Here's the formula for the magnetic field of a solenoid. We cut the number of loops in half. So divide in by two. Then double the length, so you've got to put a 2 times L, so we have 2 times 2 on the bottom. Well, whatever we do to the bottom of this side, we need to do over here. So your magnetic field would be divided by 4. So to make those two changes, it would decrease to 1 quarter of its original value. Of course, uh, it does say explain. So all of this explanation here, you gotta find a way to put that into your own words. 18 is kind of hard to see. So I'll redraw it for you so that you can follow along a little bit better. We've got two wires. I'll call this wire alpha. And we have a horizontal wire, which I will call beta. In wire alpha, we have a current running up the wire. In wire beta, we have a current going to the right. And we have two questions, it's a two-parter. Does the magnetic field on the right side of the vertical wire, so in this area, this is the right side of the vertical wire, does it go into the page, out of the page, upward, downward, toward the left, or toward the right? Everyone got their right hand warmed up? Because <laughs> that's how you're gonna answer this. Stick your thumb in the direction of the wire. Curl your fingers around. What is the direction of the magnetic field to the right of the wire? I wasn't aware I had so many amputees in the class. Everyone's got a right hand. You should be able to do this one. I would assume forward. Uh, you mean by forward, 
do you mean into the page or out of the page, left, right, up, down? Like perpendicular to the second wire. Uh, so this wire is going this way. Perpendicular would either be out of the page or into the page. I'm saying out of the page. Out of the page? All right. Well, put your thumb up. Off to the left of your thumb, what are your fingers doing? Oh, they're curving. Oh, yeah, they're curving out of the page to the right. So out over to the left, they're curling out of the page. And then we follow that around this way. And on this side, they are going into the page. So there's your answer. On the right side of the vertical wire, they have to be going into the page. Part B, does the magnetic field above the, above the horizontal wire, that is in this area right here, is that going into the page, out of the page, up, down, left, or right? All right, right hand, thumb out, curl your fingers. What's going on above it? How about you, Zach? Help me out. You've got a right hand. Anybody? Wouldn't it be going out of the page? Out of the page is correct. And then below, it would curl around and start going into the page. If you guys were having that much trouble with that, then I am very worried because this week's quiz, you have to think, how many of the five that we've just done were about the right hand rule? Three? A lot. What does that tell you about this week's end of the week quiz? It will most likely comprise of that a lot. Yeah, this is going to make up a significant portion of that. So if you guys are, are struggling with this and that's the problem, then you need to practice. Uh, well, almighty send a care package. Uh, if you are just being shy about answering questions because you're like worried that this is going to be recorded, uh, who cares? Um, but this is totally going to be on that quiz. Uh, by the way, this week's quiz. Now, last week I gave you Friday to Saturday. However, this weekend has not one but two holidays. For one thing, Friday is Good Friday, and Sunday is Easter Sunday. So I'm announcing now, and all of you should take note, this week's gizmo and end of the week quiz will be due Friday, uh, no, not Friday, not Saturday, not Sunday, but Monday at midnight. So the midnight where Tuesday begins, that is 12 a.m. Tuesday, the end of Monday, that is when they will be due. So you're getting a pretty significant extension on this one due to the holidays. You're welcome. Man, you guys are rude. Thank you. There we go. Finally, some gratitude around here. <laughs> Last one that I'm willing to do with you guys, because I got to give you something to do uh, for yourself. But I'll show you how to at least set up the math ones. Number 19. 
Find the magnetic field 6.25 centimeters from a long straight wire carrying 5.81 amperes of current. Well, the magnetic field around a long straight wire is current times mu naught divided by two pi radial distance from the wire. Use your three bracket method to uh, solve this one and it'll go by real quickly, real easily. Our current is 5.81 amps. Our distance from the wire is 6.25 centimeters. However, we don't want it in centimeters. We always want it in base units, which is meters. So 6.25 centimeters in meters. Move that decimal two places to the left and you've converted it. 0 0.0625 meters. Last thing we need in order to plug in is mu naught. But this is a constant. Constants are called constants because they always have the same value. That is what is constant about them. And the value for mu naught in this universe is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meters per ampere. That is enough to plug in and find the strength of the magnetic field. Magnetic field, plug in for current, 5.81 amps. Plug in for mu naught, 4 pi times 10 to the negative seven Tesla meters per amp, divided by two pi 0 0.0625 meters. You could either type it into your calculator exactly like that. Although, strong recommendation would be to put the entire denominator in parentheses. Whenever you have two terms on the bottom, either put them together in parentheses or multiply them first before you try dividing. But if you type it into your calculator exactly like this, you should get the answer. Uh, notice that amps is on the top and bottom, meters is on the top and bottom, and pi is on the top and bottom. So there's some stuff that cancels out and you don't need to worry about typing in. 5.81 times four, we canceled out the pi, times 10 to the power of negative seven, divided by, remember the whole bottom should be in parentheses, two times 0 0.0625 close those parentheses and we get 1.86 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. And you might be thinking, well, that doesn't seem like a lot. That's not even like, what, 19 micro Tesla? That seems pretty small. Well, it is pretty small, but then again, a Tesla is a lot of magnetic field strength. Those junkyard electromagnets that are used to pick up cars, to pick up cars, those are one Tesla. One Tesla at your head is enough to redirect the electrical currents in your brain so that you get confused because you're not sending the signals to the right places. Like one Tesla is formidable. So this is considerably less than a Tesla, yet it's about double the magnetic field strength of the planet. So the magnetic field strength of the planet that can uh, you know, turn a compass needle, it's about double that. Use the three bracket method to solve 20, 21, and 22, and you guys will be done with this for the week. 
like I said, I did want to leave some of those for you to do, you dang self. I want to go over the gizmo, and then we will call it a day for this uh, meeting. I know a few of you have already given this week's gizmo a shot, and I've reset a couple of those shots, uh, but let's uh, do this one together. All right, everyone should be able to see it. There's some things we can adjust about our trebuchet. We can control the length of the long arm from which the payload launches, and we can control the length of the short arm where there is the counterweight. We can control the angle of the prong with the sling mounted to it, the length of the sling, the weight of the payload, and also how high the armature is off the ground. We set it to uh, launch and let's hit play, see what happens with just the default. And we don't quite hit the castle. Going back to the design, Somebody suggest something that might get me a little bit closer to the, the castle. Like if I could just change one thing and see what it does, suggest one. It's a long Maybe list. change the counterweight. All right. You want to increase it or decrease it? Increase it. All right. Of course, like you guys always do with gizmos, I'll go straight to maxing it out to see what happens. All right, it didn't quite go that much further, but did you see that it went like a lot faster? So what's something that we could do? So that, that made it go faster, but we want it to go farther. So if it's not the counterweight that makes it go farther, uh, or at least not much farther, What's something that might change that launch angle so that we can get more vertical? The um, prong angle. All right. You want to decrease that or increase that? I'm going to say decrease it. All right. Let's go from 40 to 24. Let's see what that does. It swung off the back. <laughs> um, Maybe I decreased it too much. Let's try 30. All right. So if it's too flat, it uh, seems to just fall off. Maybe if I make the... Make yeah, it was weird. Like, like, I got it to, like, fly higher up. But if I decrease it too much, it would just fly off the back and not go anywhere. Well, this is a longer arm. Let's see what that does. Yeah, that prong angle's got to change. It was at 40 and 40 launched. Barely decreased it to 35. All right, so it just keeps falling off the back of it. So I'm going to set it back to 40 so that stops happening. Let's maybe try increasing the sling length. Like maybe it'll swing farther forward before letting go of it. Hey, that worked. Am I going to miss the castle? I missed the castle. So I got my launch angle right, but it's going too fast. So let's undo that counterweight. We knew that the counterweight being bigger would make it go faster. So let's shrink that back down. And I think I decreased it too much. Bump it back up. Maybe bump this back down because I increased that too. There we go. There we go. Ah, I overshot the target. 
And I also didn't have enough energy on impact to damage the wall. Let's make it heavier. Remember, kinetic energy is a function of two things. Kinetic energy is one half the mass times the square of the velocity. We've got enough speed, so maybe if we have some more mass. Or maybe that was too much mass. All right, well, maybe if I increase the mass on both sides. All right, I think this one might hit it. That's what she said. Boom! Woo! We did it. We took them out. Uh, notice that we did have enough kinetic energy. We have actually less speed than when we like overshot it, but adding mass gave us that bonus kinetic energy to take that castle wall out. Uh, hang on, let me write that formula out so that everyone has it to refer to because this is like a major key to a couple of different questions on here. Kinetic energy is one half the mass times the square of the velocity. If I switch camera, oh, that's not what I meant by switch camera. And here we, let's look at the questions. Let's try number three. A projectile must have 150 kilojoules, that is 150,000 joules, to breach a city wall, which of these would actually crack the wall? The first one has a mass of 100 kilograms and a speed of 55 meters per second. The next one has 150 kilograms at 42 meters per second. And the last one is 200 kilograms at 36 meters per second. And remember, our goal is to hit the, well, it's also to hit the wall, but hit the wall with 150 uh, kilojoules. So we're basically just going to plug these into the formula. If it has 150 kilojoules or more, we break the wall. If it is 150, or less than 150, then it won't break the wall. So this one's going to be one half 155 meters per second squared. One half times 100 times 55 squared. 151,250. Will that break that wall? Anybody? Like barely, I think. Yeah, it's more. It's more than 150,000, therefore this one works. So we know that the answer has to be either A or all of the above. How can we figure out which one of those two it is? Well, we do the rest. If they all come out to more than 150, then they all break the wall and all of the above is the answer. So let's try this one. One half of 150 kilograms times 42 meters per second squared. One half of 150 times 42 meters per second squared. 132,300. Is that enough to break the wall? Nope. No. Therefore, what must the answer to the question be? A. It's A. And it can't be all of the above because not all of the ones did it. So that one's got to be A. Therefore, you know that one. With one down, you have only four to go. And remember, I was very generous and extended it until Monday for you guys. So good luck. Uh, this gizmo, again, didn't have anything to do with magnetism. It was just a fun one. All the magnetism gizmos are kind of hard. 
So rather than hit you with like hard one after hard one after hard one all like for all month, uh, I figured I'd give you a fun one to kind of create a break. All right. Unless there are any more questions, which I'm guessing there probably won't be. Uh, um, if there are any more questions, I'll answer them. If not, let's end it. All right. See you, Mr. Stone. Adios, guys. Good luck. Peace out, dog. Bye, Mr. Stone. Adios. Bye.